Hello, everyone. Um, it's pleasure to be here with you. Uh, today we have a wonderful uh, guest, David Frum, who many of you know, I'm sure you have read and seen. He's a senior editor and writer for The Atlantic. He's the author of uh, 10 books. He served in a number of positions as a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, as a trustee of the Republican Jewish Coalition, uh, chairman of the board of trustees for the Policy Exchange. He was a speechwriter. Uh, in President George uh, W. Bush's administration, and he was part of the Winds of Change movement uh, uh, in the early 2000s that helped to bring together different coalitions of conservatism. He's a very prolific writer. You see him on uh, different networks and uh, radio stations, and he's the author of several books, including uh, Dead Right, How We Got Here, Patriots, uh, The Right Man, uh, a book we discussed together a few years ago, Trumpocracy. Uh, and today we're going to talk about his new book, uh, Trumpocalypse, Restoring uh, American Democracy. I hope I said that right. Uh, Harper Collins, 2020. It's a really uh, wonderful, uh, important, and troubling read. Uh, and I'm uh, delighted that we have time to talk about this. So, uh, welcome, David. Thank you so much, Julian, and congratulations on the success of, of, of your new book about uh, Speaker Gingrich and, and those formative years in the 1990s. Thanks so much. Um, well, let's start. You write that Trumpism will not be so easily removed from American life, an important premise. What do you mean by that? Well, um, President we, we hear a lot of talk about the Trump base. Its size is often exaggerated. Um, I'm sorry, that, that, that was a click and let's get rid of that. Um, that not everyone in that 40 to 44% uh, who gives a Trump approval is truly part of the Trump base. But there, when you ask about strong approval of the president, you get a number of about 25 to 30% of, of the population that knowing everything we know, including the terrible pandemic, the economic crisis, I mean, a litany of, of troubles, unlike anything seen since the early 1930s. They're still with the president who, who delivered all of that. Um, you, we all know who those people are and we, there, there's much talk about what binds them to him. But most fundamentally, there is a disregard for constitutional institutions, a contempt for liberal values, and those people are going to be with us. Um, and they are a proven political resource. In the past, Republican coalitions have tried to find ways to use the potential power of that group without letting that group have too much of the upper hand in the way the party governed. And that's a, a lot, you've worked very hard on that, on that description, that history. But that group now feels its own power. And I think the QAnon movement um, is maybe a sign, is possibly a sign of things, things to come. So we are going to have to uh, govern the country in a new way. And let me say one last thing about that. You know, uh, the American system is very imperfectly dem democratic. That's always been true. And it's hard even to imagine what perfect democracy would mean. Um, but it, um, since the end of the civil, since the civil rights era, it's been um, very unusual for any politician in American life to openly disparage the idea of democracy, to say that somehow it's, it doesn't matter whether you get more votes than the other person, or, or to suggest that maybe not everybody should vote, or that not all votes should count equally. Um, in uh, the Tea Party years, and then uh, the Republicans discovered, and especially in the Trump years, they've discovered that they are, if their present coalition, their present policies are inherently minority. They cannot win so long as they hold a, a, a functioning governing majority, so long as they espouse what they are espousing. So they were faced with a choice, either change the party's ideas or change the American political system. Um, and Trump showed that the second was a viable option, that it was possible to gain quite a lot of power in the American system by dispensing with norms of democracy as they'd been understood for a long time. And that lesson, I think, does not get so forgot. Um, and every time you hear uh, an important conservative voice or Republican representative say, we're a republic, not a democracy, they are learning from Donald Trump that there's a path to power that involves breaking with American institutions to get their way. And so uh, that's the strategic history. Um, but in terms of principle, you came of age during the Reagan years. You wrote a very good book on the 70s. and. Period when conservatism took hold, uh, 
and you, you've been part of this movement. How did the movement get from the place where it was in the 80s when Reagan was in the White House, in your mind, to this moment where there are substantial numbers of Republicans who, as you say, um, are at odds or hostile to basic democratic processes? Well, I'm glad to be in a university seminar so I can give a more academic rather than a more cable TV kind of answer. Um, so my basic view is um, that American politics is driven by the rise of movements that have a complicated relationship to the party system. And the movements uh, arise to meet specific problems. And the classic example would be capital P progressivism uh, in the early 20th century. Um, and they bring together a lot of people who did, weren't formally associated with one another, who may have many different things that separate them, but there are, there's a question or a series of questions that unites these people, and they go to work on that set of issues. And sometimes they win, and sometimes they fail. Um, but at some point, they exhaust the impetus that brought them together. You know, uh, the temperance movement doesn't exist anymore. Um, and uh, the progressive movement, as we know, does, doesn't really exist anymore. They, they did some things, they failed to do other things, new questions arose. So in my mind, the conservative movement, um, as I came into it in the 1970s, took a lot of sort of frag fragments of the losers of the battles over the New Deal, the losers over battles into the Second World War, um, the losers over battle of, battles over civil rights. These were all very much minority movements. And then they joined them with a lot of other people over a set of issues that were very specific to the 1970s. Inflation, crime, um, reaction to, uh, the, after the civil rights movement, there was a whole surge of social movements of all kinds, especially the women's movement. Um, and uh, there are people who are left uh, in opposition to those things. And, and it brought all of those people together into a powerful coalition that gave, beginning around the early 1970s, gaining force through the middle 1970s, <clears throat> and that came to power in the Reagan years and reached its, and then and had a kind of Indian summer in the Gingrich years. Um, so what happened to that? Well, the same thing that happened to the progressives. On some issues, they won. They succeeded. They stopped the inflation. They won the Cold War. Uh, they brought crime down. On other issues, they failed to the point where it was obvious they were just going to fail. Um, that the, the uh, reaction against the women's movement, the reaction against the other social movements, they, they lost those fights. And then, and they sort of accepted that they lost. And so what was left was, it's, it's a little like, uh, maybe the way I, I think of it is, it, it was a little bit like being born an opponent of Andrew Jackson and living into the 1880s. Um, and you know, you grew, you know, you, you're still Whiggish, but it ceased to be meaningful to be a Whig if you lived in the 1880s and 1890s. And in, in the same way, I think conservatism, and I, I don't, I, I think we did a lot of, I think a lot of things the conservative movement accomplished were good. Um, but politics is a game or a business where they keep rotating the questions, and your success just buys you the right to answer new questions, and the new questions create new coalitions. And I think the story of the conservative movement is it's just, it's just not talking about things that respond to the questions of American society in the 2010s and 2020s. Let me say one more, one concrete thing about that at the risk of a long-winded answer. Um, uh, in the financial crisis of 2008 and 9, um, the federal government responded by creating a lot of credit and a lot of money in the loosest sense of that term. And those of us who remember the 70s had an idea that must lead to inflation. And so the Tea Party movement became very opposed to this creation of credit because it was convinced they, they, they just knew it had to lead to inflation. And they were kind of hoping it would lead to inflation because they knew what to do. If the problem was inflation, conservatives knew what to do. If the problem was a massive global contraction, they didn't really know what to do. And Eric Cantor, who inherited it, who's a wealthy man, inherited money, his dis financial disclosures proved he bet a lot of his own personal wealth on the belief that there would be inflation in 2009 and lost a lot of money. It wasn't just talk, he really believed it. And um, let me take a quick uh, break from the questions to say people, there's a lot of people listening, feel free to send in questions and answers in the chat box and we'll try to get them uh, at the end. Um, can I ask you, you, your last book, I think it was 2018 that it came out. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it really centered on corruption uh, and mm -hmm. conflict of interest issues in the administration. Now you've moved to democracy yeah. and also the U.S. standing in the world. Can you just talk a little bit about the connection between the two books for readers and how yeah. your thinking evolved about the administration? Well, um, I, I didn't plan it, but it, they did, did turn into a two book cycle. And um, while the, tritle, the titles are a little bit of tongue twisters, <laughs> and while the second title in particular may sound a little um, theatrical, I mean, because when people hear apocalypse, they think it means zombies. Mm -hmm. um, I actually mean both titles very literally. So uh, Trumpocracy comes from the, the second half of that word comes from the Greek word that means power or rule. And Trumpocracy was a story of how Trump gained and intended to use power. And an apocalypse, although we think it means the end of the world, actually it means a revel in Greek, a revelation, a vision of the, and what the um, evangels and apostles had visions of was the end of the world, but you can have a vision of anything. And so uh, Trumpocalypse tries to give a vision of what comes after, what, what comes next. And, in, and with a view to making sure that we can, we can shape what comes next, because I think we are moving into a period of challenges to the constitutional order and democratic government, uh, be driven by the fact that in many ways, m many people feel that the government, that the systems they have have not delivered very well for them. And that's a problem, not just in the United States, but all over the world. So one, so the two books are in dialogue. One tries to explain the system of power and the other tries to explain how do we get to a better world? And in this second one, you have a chapter about uh, the impeachment and mm -hmm. the, uh, misuses of power uh, by the president, you have a chapter, The Wall of Impunity. Um, and you argue first that what's become clear uh, is that a lot of, you say, uh, presidential cooperation with the law is voluntarily voluntary, uh, especially if he or she retains a sufficient blo blocking vote in Congress. So we learn the norms are a little bit fragile and that they are just norms. And we learn how partisanship can basically protect the president. Um, what's going on with the GOP on that front? How, how do you see the impeachment, how it unfolded, and, and what it says about this moment? Well, I think I, think, um, I had been writing, and I, this is now, I think, a pretty common view, but um, I wrote this in articles that were early, and I wrote this, that all during the, there was this, there was this weird cult of Mueller, Bob Mueller, um, that, uh, Ripped. I think a lot of people watch a lot of cable TV, and and uh, and I always felt about Bob Mueller. There's a wonderful line from from the thick of it, where a, a wonderful British series about politics, where a character describes another character as being inside the box, and he's corrected. She's not inside the box. Once inside the box, she then builds a second box that is inside the box, and she lives inside of that second smaller box. And I thought it was Bob Mueller that that he accepted a definition of his job that guaranteed from the start that he could not succeed. And the reason what he did was, this is a very legalistic country and Bob Mueller is a lawyer and an FBI director. Um, what we do when there is a scandal, what Americans do when there's a scandal, is they should, let's, let's go look for the f prosecutable federal crime. Uh, and, and then cable TV fills up with former federal prosecutors who then start quoting gibberish about the US code. And um, everyone acquires a kind of barstool knowledge of that section of the federal code that is in dispute. And what we were unready for is, well, what if the scandal is not illegal? Um, what, what, if the, what if the president is doing something that uh, no one is not illegal because no, it never occurred to anybody that a president would do such a thing? And so it's just part of the general catch-all of misgovernment that is governed by, by the political impeachment clause. And, um, you know, so, you know, Robert Mueller converted the non-legal concept of collusion into the legal concept of conspiracy and began to look for a criminal conspiracy. And when he didn't find a criminal conspiracy, um, he then lost interest in questions like, why were the Russians so interested in Donald Trump anyway? You know, why would they... They, they, they read Nate Silver. They knew that Hillary was probably going to win in 2016. They'd experienced with her. They knew she was not a forgiving personality. If they, you know, it was a huge risk to muck about in the American political system in the way that they did. Why? What, what was, they, they, and they had not done it before because, you know, from, from, you know, a, from a, even Ronald Reagan, from a Soviet point of view, they didn't like Ronald Reagan, but they, 
Walter Mondale is going to present all kinds of problems of his own, including he might spend more on conventional forces, uh, less on nuclear, more on conventional forces. You know, you might have less certain strategic pressures, but you have more human rights talk. It, you know, Walter Mondale, no bargain. Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, again, bad each, I mean, certainly not worth risking what you would risk to intervene in the American political system either way. But for Donald Trump, they were willing to do what they were not willing to do for the opponents even of Ronald Reagan. Why? That is the overwhelming question. Now, it's not illegal for an American private businessman to own to owe a lot of money to Russian businessmen. Um, you know, maybe he tripped across a specific money laundering statute um, or some disclosure rule. But unless he's made that kind of technical infraction, um, the things that Donald Trump looks like he was doing before he became president aren't were not illegal for a private citizen to do. But we needed to know about them, and we do not because the Mueller report um, just Put and the, and Bob Rosen, uh, Rob Rosenstein at the Department of Justice that everyone agreed to put that outside of consideration, and so the oh, so that chapter and I, I'm sorry I'm giving you long answers I apologize so so the message of those chapters is there was this sunny American conviction that the institutions would hold that the American system of government is so strong and maybe because I grew up in Canada um, I, I I am not as certain about American institutions as so many Americans are. But do you think, so kind of building on that, had the prosecution been different, uh, either from Mueller or from the House Democrats, would it possibly have led to a different outcome? Uh, or are we just learning how much tolerance or indifference there is at this point to that kind of use of presidential power? Which, which of the yeah. two do you think this? But both are true. But both are true. Um, that even a better, even had things been done differently, I mean, the wall of impunity was there. Um, I think what, what was unearthed, because Trump, of course, was not impeached for exactly the Russia part of the Russian scandal. He was impeached for the Ukraine part. And there he was just caught dead to rights doing, I mean, there we did know everything we needed to know. And he was caught dead to rights trying to coerce a vulnerable country uh, to fabricate negative political information against a political opponent with a view to influencing the election and everyone, it, there was, there was no factual dispute about what happened. Um, so maybe it's true that if a different kind of approach, a non-criminal approach, had brought to light evidence that Donald Trump owed a lot of money inside Russia um, or had other kinds of contacts there, maybe that, that the impunity there would have held. Uh, but at least then the, the, the value of the impeachment process is you refine the issue enough that you make the, the sponsors wear it and wear it not just in one election cycle, but for a long time to come. And I mean, I think that's why uh, not just this election, but the next few will uh, kind of be important, but we'll come back to that uh, in terms of the GOP and how it changes or doesn't. Um, but another theme in your book, which I thought was really interesting, was on the US standing in the world. And, and you really talk about how bad things have become uh, during this presidency. Yeah. And yet there's a paradox in that relatively there's no major hotspots. We're not in the middle of a major conflict. Uh, and in that sense, he has put America first. Um, mm -hmm. How do you explain the fact we're not in the middle of a contentious war and yet our standing just keeps deteriorating? Well, um, we are, we, we do have a significant conflict in Afghanistan and, and Trump did get um, American special operators killed in Mali and in, in, in Yemen. Um, but it, I think what, um, what is true there is Donald Trump, although he's obviously not intellectual, he's not well-informed and he's not intellectually nimble. He is a wily, canny assessor of strength and weakness. I think one of the things he understood in a way that no, the table, cable commentators who congratulate him on becoming president every uh, regular intervals once a month and have never understood about him. He understood that he did not have the legitimacy to lead the country into war, that, that, that actually his, that, that a major war, just as this pandemic has cracked apart his coalition and the recession has, he understood that a war would do the same thing. He couldn't speak for the country, he had no interest in speaking to it. But what, I, what, I, what I'm worried about most um, is this, just to give you an Look, whoever became president in 2016 was going to face a really tough problem driven by this. When I worked in the Bush administration, which is now not even quite 20 years ago, depending on who's counting, the U.S. economy was somewhere between three and six times the size of the economy of China. 
Today, depending on who's counting, the Chinese economy is probably about 80% the size of the United States. And sometime in the next decade, maybe even if we continue to do as badly as we're doing right now in the next half decade, the Chinese economy will overtake the American economy in absolute size. Now, Americans remain vastly wealthier than Chinese people. We divide that output over fewer heads. Um, but America's power in the world was doomed to decline uh, no matter what. And the answer to that was uh, to build coal. If, you're, if you seek to restrain China, uh, the answer has to be you have to do it through, through coalitions and partnerships. And not just the familiar and comfortable ones um, with the Europeans and the British, although Donald Trump has done a lot of damage to those, but some new and exotic ones with, with India, with Vietnam of all places. Um, you know, these are going to have to become coalition partners for the United States if you're going to mobilize and not to fight China, but to constrain China. To, um, and that, that was the idea behind the Trans-Pacific Partnership is let's write a trade deal that is so enticing that China will want to be part of it. And let's write it without them being part of it and then present them. Here's, you know, we wrote the, the rules of the club without you. And if you want to join the club, here's where you have to sign. Um, Donald Trump has done a lot of damage to that. And he's done damage that will be enduring because what, one of the most important moves is the move from zero to one. Um, before, in 2010, if you would ask a financial analyst, what, is the, what are the odds the United States would ever default on its debt? They would say zero. And after this, the hijinks of the Tea Party uh, Congresses, they would say, well, it remains very unlikely, but it's not zero anymore. It's, it's, it's something. And in the same way, what are the odds the United States would not defend a NATO member? They used to be zero. Don't, now they're not zero. Um, and so everyone adjusts accordingly. And, and all kinds of partners, are not, and not just the Europeans, but I mean, the Indians, the Vietnamese, the South Koreans, the Japanese, they all have to think a little differently about the United States. And once they think, have that thought, that thought's not going anywhere. And even if Joe Biden comes in and brings all kinds of old pans and has a very bipartisan foreign policy, there are lots of you know, Romney-style Republicans, and they go around the world with a, the, we will need an apology tour this time, vowing to all friends and allies, we will never, ever, ever mix tequila and quaaludes ever again, we swear. Uh, the allies will say, I don't know, our defense planning horizon is 30 years. Are you telling us this will never happen again in the next 30 years? Because it happened. Yeah. And but so let me ask this. I mean, how do you think this situation compares this lack of confidence in the credibility of the US, which, which is essentially what you're arguing? How does it compare to where we were in 2008, pre-election? Uh, yeah. Also a controversial moment. How, how do you put those two uh, next to each other moments? Um, well, to, it, where we were in two, 2008 was a little bit like where we were after Vietnam, um, that the United States had moved into controversial wars. It had brought some allies with it, but uh, other allies not. Um, and it had made a bet where uh, six, the only way to vindicate itself was through success. Right? That because the United, you know, if, if if there had been weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, or if there had been a UN, a, 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 some kind of international legitimacy, if there had been a giant international coalition, um, if NATO, if NATO had authorized it to the UN, then you could you could still fail without challenging the legitimacy. Or if you do it without the process of legitimacy, if you have success, uh, or you find the weapons, as it was, we got we were we looked like losers, and we looked like. Um, belligerent, we, we look like losers who had lost a fight that we ourselves had started for no good reason. So that, that's pretty bad. Um, but uh, but what, it was also true, the, the difference in where we were with after Iraq was um, that there had been a lot of legal, legal formalities um, around the Iraq war. There was a, an authorizing resolution in Congress um, uh, that there were, if there was not a specific UN resolution authorizing the Iraq war, there were pre-existing UN re resolutions um, that the Iraqis had violated, that the United States could plausibly claim to have power to enforce, and, and a bunch of things like that. And, and, um, and we had also create, we had also, uh, um, uh, we had also inadvertently created some new coalitions and, and created some new allies. And, um, you know, that, uh, including unintended consequence by empowering Iran 
which was one of the unintended consequences of the war, we also frightened the Gulf states into building a new relationship with Israel and creating a new set of, of, of pro-American or America-friendly. So, so we, were, we were no question in, in a jam, but we didn't look weak. I mean, in 2008, it was still true. The United States was overwhelmingly the strongest power on earth. Uh, the, the great Chinese boom that began in the early part of the 21st century was moving fast in 2008, but still, I'm not, not going to remember that, but they still would have been less than half the GDP of the United States. And we also had done in the Bush years, one of the less attended success of the Bush years is he had, although he had not done a good job maintaining the relationships with traditional allies in Europe, he'd done an extremely good job building the most important new relationship of the 21st century, the U.S.-India alliance. Uh, that Bush left that in, in really strong hands. And that is now not entirely through our fault, but that, that is now much weaker. But where we are now is we are a much lonelier country with a, in a much more adverse international environment. Um, and in a way that leaves, that looks like not a un unique mistake. I mean, Vietnam happened and then half a century later or a third of a century later, Iraq happened. Um, but Donald Trump could happen again in 2024. And um, let me turn to a little different subject, the two other elements of your book, and, and there are questions I want to get to. You have a chapter, White Terror, uh, and, mm -hmm. and you don't use the term white nationalism. Uh, you argue yeah. that's not the way to think about it. Uh, this kind of what I think is an overt uh, appeal and form of rhetoric that the president uses and, and we've seen as a key element. Uh, why does he do it and what's going on? And, and conservatives are debating what role does this have to play in this movement yeah. that we've built? What, where do you come down on that? Well, thank you. So um, I, I do think that we now have a proper international terrorist movement. And I, I don't like the term white nationalist because it, it overlooks this is not, an, these are not nationalists. They, they are actually, and I give sort of chapter and verse on that in the book, how, how uh, it's, it's, like, it's like the obverse of the jihadi movement. And people go to websites that, um, that are radicalizing and you know, Americans in this movement uh, cite immigration into Europe as one of their great grievances. You know, you go to Aust Australians, go to uh, Germany to be radicalize, go, uh, get their weapons in Britain, and then go commit their crimes in New Zealand. Um, so it is an international terrorist movement like the jihadi movement. And it's become very powerful uh, in the past half dozen years. And it, it's, we now see it um, taking its first steps into open, uh, I mean, the whole point of terrorism is a clandestine act. Uh, we're now seeing militias forming. And we saw them in Portland, and uh, we saw them in Kenosha. And they're still pretty small and well within the ability of the police to control if the police want to, but the police don't always seem to want to. Um, and this is going to be, I think, one of the things that is going to be enduring. I mean, if we have a Biden presidency, um, and if it moves American public policy, not only to the left in economic terms, but in more multicultural, more multi-ethnic ways, and I think a lot of the Trump movement is going to turn itself into an extra political movement. And that's, that's the real, uh, I'm going to point to something that is really, uh, maybe just a byway, maybe I'm completely wrong about this, but uh, so as of Thursday, today's Monday, as of Thursday, I had never heard of a movie called Cuties. Um, and uh, on Thursday, my wife to told me about it. And like everyone, we're watching a lot more movies these days than we used to. <laughs> so after dinner, we sat down and, and watched this movie. And uh, I had mixed reactions to it. It, it doesn't matter, I'm not a film critic. Um, I then become aware that there's this giant global controversy about this thing. Um, and I, I, I wrote something on Twitter, very like non-committal about the movie, just like I was startled by the, the scale of this controversy. And suddenly I'm flooded by tens of thousands of super anti-Semitic comments. So for those who haven't seen the movie, the movie is made by a French woman of Senegalese origin. It deals with a multi-ethnic group of Jew, uh, girls, none of whom is Jewish. None of whom encounter, there's not, I don't think a Jewish character in the entire movie. I don't think anyone involved in the production or distribution is an, what is, like, why is this interesting to anti-Semitic people? But it, but it feeds into the QAnon movement and the QAnon movement is soaked with anti-Semitism. Um, and, and the QAnon movement is increasingly violent and heav heavily armed. And I just, I, I, I wonder in the post-Trump world whether, I talked about how you have movement, that the story of progressivism and conservatism and Whiggism is things move from 
non-politics into politics and become organized political movements, things can also go the other way. Um, and things can just drop out of politics um, and become uh, become subpolitical in the way that, say, after 1969, a lot of the, the anti-Vietnam War movement drifted from activist politics to small terrorist groups like the Symbionese Liberation Army. So rather than a third party, or uh, if they don't find room in the end in the GOP, it could be an extra political or, a, a, you know, whatever you want to call it, proto-political movement uh, on yeah. the outside. Ex extra parliamentary, okay. I would say. But, uh, extra yeah. parliamentary. You have some tough words for the media, about the media. Uh, you're in the media. I appear in the media. Yeah. It's always interesting to talk about it. But what role is that playing right now in our politics? Well. Those of us of a certain age, we say the media. Uh, we mean a group of um, legacy companies with ancient histories and subscription models um, that self-consciously are in the content production business. CNN, the New York Times, the Atlantic, where I work. Um, and I think the beginning of all wisdom on this topic is to understand that far and away the most important media company in the country is Facebook. Um, and uh, the second most is the YouTube division of, of Google. Um, and no cable company is in, except Fox is maybe in the top five. Um, but Fox without Facebook would not be what it is. Um, and uh, we need to, we are moving into a new kind of media era um, that uh, that is much more networked and distributed um, and run by people who have no who refuse to accept that they are in the media business and so take no responsibility. Uh, for what they produce. And I think the reaction to a lot of the um, events we've seen, I mean, the, you know, we have tens of thousands of people uh, who are homeless because of wildfires fires on the Pacific West Coast, on the West Coast. And that has been, a, if you get your information from Facebook, and if it's not your house that is burned down, you would think that is a, that that is a much smaller deal than uh, the fact that, you know, some petty criminals have defaced or in one case tried to set a fire inside a police station in, in Portland, Oregon. And the book has many other uh, interesting elements about how Democrats can lose the election, about um, a series of reforms you propose, policy and structural uh, for improvement. And uh, maybe we'll get to some of that in the Q&A, but everyone can read it. I do wanna ask before I go to the Q&A, just about you. I mean, you are, you are part of the conservative movement, as we said earlier. You've been part of it for a long time, and now you're living through this you know, the disruptive, dysfunctional period and, and writing about this as an opponent of the president. And yeah. what's it like to be, I don't know if you call yourself a never Trump or whatever term you use, what's it like to be in that position in 220? Well, first I would say there's an old saying that if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. I have two dogs, so I have no problems. Um, look, I, what I, I, the, the, many of my sort of friends and associates have exited the Republican Party and, and often in quite spectacular public ways. I remain a registered Republican. I am certainly, I'm, I don't use the noun a conservative anymore because I don't know that it means anything, uh, but I'm certainly a, a conservative person in a lot of, in, in almost every way. Uh, and I remain a registered Republican. I think one of the most important battles of the next decade, and certainly the most important battle for me, my fight, is to join the fight to Bill or to return the, the Republican Party away from this path it's on, to, which is toward a kind of neo-fascism. I mean, not like the old fascism. It, it'll obviously it'll be, history doesn't repeat itself. Um, uh, but to be a proper center-right party of enterprise again. I mean, I you know my you know uh, my sympathies, my interests are always with, with you know the business holders, the business creators. Um, you know. Uh, you know, in, in, uh, in investors, um, you know, that I, uh, I worry about open trade and a dynamic profit motive economy. Um, that's, that's my, you know, that's my worldview. Uh, but what we have seen across, across the developed world is that party, that there, there is something going on and it's going on in places in semi-developed countries, India and Brazil, where parties of the right are, they're not, they don't have like marching hooligans the, the way they did in the 1930s. And we, of course, the world of the 21st century is much less tolerant of open violence than the 19 than the world of the 20th century was. You know, um, if you if you add up every person m murdered by a, a white supremacist criminal or gang in this 
since Donald Trump became president, including not just the American casualties, but those outside the United States, it still wouldn't add up to a single weekend in Weimar, Germany. Um, so we are a much gentler place. Mm -hmm. But with all that said, um, that you can, you can see that there is a tendency in parties of the right, and you've written about this, to move away from um, the distributional politics of the 1950s, 60s, 70s toward this new identity politics. And maybe it's not a surprise that as our societies become first more diverse, second, as there's permission to, for, the, for people from diverse backgrounds to become more ethnically self-assertive to their micro group, that the former majority also becomes more ethnically self-assertive. I mean, that's, you know, if, if you were to think about American politics in the 1970s, what predicts whether you're a Republican or Democrat? Basically, your relationship to the economy, right? If you own stock, if you live on salary, not wages, uh, if you own a business, uh, you're likely to be a Republican. If you live on wages, not salary, if you don't own stock, stock, if you work in the public sector, you're likely to be a Democrat. That's America 1975. What determines it today? And the answer is, did your grandparents belong to the white American majority? And if they did, you're probably a Republican. And if they didn't, you're probably not, regardless of your position in the economy. And that creates a new kind of politics, and it creates a new dangerous way to organize political life. Well, let's get to some questions. There's a lot of them. I'm going to start with one of my colleagues, the distinguished Alan Blinder, uh, a terrific economist. So we're on economics. But he says, can you play out the scenario if on election night Trump is ahead in some sense, but the mail-in ballot uh, looks likely to put Biden ahead? Yeah. Now, that's a very dangerous uh characteristically brilliant question from Alan Blinder. Um, uh, that is a really dangerous scenario because President Trump will, of course, claim victory immediately. And um, his, it'll be interesting whether he gets consent from, the, from Republicans in Congress uh, because there are a whole series of cascading things that are, I mean, the, one of the reasons this election is so fraught uh, is unlike um, 2008, this ele election is occurring in a census year. Mm -hmm. And so what is on the ballot is not just the presidency, but control of state governments. And with control of state governments is in, in 2020 is the power to redraw the maps in 2021. And a lot of states that are red states today remain red states only if Republicans draw the boundaries. If uh, Democrats draw the boundaries in North Carolina, poof, it's the next Virginia. It's, it becomes a purple state. Um, uh, Georgia, if Democrats draw the boundaries, purple state. Uh, you know, uh, Texas is probably, the, the power structure there is probably so oligarchic that, that that can't happen in Texas, but even Texas is, is not unthinkable. Um, you know, and Mich Michigan, and uh, if Republicans, again, are drawing, Michigan and Wisconsin go back to being blue states if Republican state government, sorry, Democratic state governments can draw their boundaries. Right now, in, in the state of Wisconsin, in 2018, Republicans got, I think, 44% of the vote in, the Wisconsin, in all Wisconsin state elections, and they have 65% of the seats in both houses of the Wisconsin state house. So that won't continue. Um, and so this is an existential election, not only for the president personally, who faces serious legal jeopardy if he loses the presidency, but for um, all kinds of local power holders. And so we have to really worry about that. And uh, what will the president be like as he feels desperate? What kind of permission will he give um, to the kind of people who rode into um, Portland uh, a week ago um, carrying weapons into the center of, the, of this downtown of that city? 600 cars. I mean, I want to get to Judy Marino's question, building on that. You, you've talked about the base or uh, the extreme base, but uh, Judy asked, can you talk about the complicity of Republicans to the administration, which you've talked about, but what will happen? Will there be a mea culpa if he loses, or will they double down and defend him, which is a question I get all the time. I'm curious what you think is the party as a whole. Um, Look, I, I don't know if people have ever seen a movie called um, The King of Comedy, but there's a scene where Robert De Niro playing a would-be comedian called Rupert Popkin um, has this fantasy where um, his former high school principal appears to him and says, Rupert Popkin, on behalf of all the people who wanted to make fun, who made fun of you in high school, I would like to say tonight in front of 75 million Americans that you were right and we were wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that never happens. <laughs> that never happens. So I, I think what will happen is... Um, if we have a happy outcome, uh, 
most people are just, it's just going to drift away. And most people are going to not, not admit, you know, uh, and politics will rotate, you know, uh, you will discover from Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio, how disgusted they were all along. Other people, Ron Johnson will be gone. Lin Lindsey, uh, Lindsey Graham will be gone soon. Um, but just to, to anticipate something that is there, because I think people have this idea um, that the Republican party has been in lockstep behind Trump. And we need to remember, what is the Republican Party? Uh, in the first two years, people like me were taunted over and over again by our Trumpy friends that you're, you're not a political party, you're a dinner party or a cocktail party. Then comes the election of 2018 and millions and upon millions of Republican leaning women in affluent suburbs show up to vote for Democratic candidates in the highest turnout non-presidential election since before the First World War. The seat that was held by George H.W. Bush in um, the most affluent area of Houston. H.W. Uh, Bush won it in 66, and it stayed Republican from 66, unbroken through 2018. That went Democratic. Newt Gingrich's former seat, which you've written so much about, that which had been Republican since 1978, that went Democratic. Eric Cantor's former seat uh, in the most affluent part of Western Richmond, that went Democratic. Um, the area, uh, the South Bank of the Potomac River near the CIA, which has been Republican for 60 of the past 66 years, that went Democratic. Overwhelmingly because of the vote, votes of women. All, in all four of those cases, the winning candidate was a woman and a conservative leaning woman, not a member of the squad. I mean, often with national security credentials or a national security background. Abigail, the uh, woman who took over Eric Cantor's seat, was a former CIA officer. Um, and what you saw was actually there were millions of people who, um, you know, uh, would vote certainly Republican for state offices, um, who probably liked Mitt Romney quite a lot, probably voted for George W. Bush in 2004, millions of them. And they voted for Democratic uh, members of the House who weren't too extreme in 2018. Um, so I don't think people should think of these things as being unchanging, that there has been a lot of dynamic um, in, in most polls now, Joe, Joe Biden is over 50% among white men with college degrees, not just white women. And okay, let me get to another question. I have so much I can ask you, but I'm going to, uh, I will hold back. Uh, someone asked, what uh, do you think about the stability of President Trump's approval in the face of mishandling the pandemic? Um, they say that you had mentioned earlier in the spring you thought he'd lose support, but now Trump is fairly competitive. Do you have the same prediction? I'm just going to say, I mentioned before having two friends in Washington who are dogs. One of the dogs is yeah. trapped in this room, and he hears dinner being served elsewhere in the house, so I'm going to have to open the door. Else there's one of those pathetic whimpering and whining sounds, so just excuse me for that. Okay. Um, I, I have to say that I, I am kind of amazed that there hasn't been more of a hit to the president's approval rating. And I, it is a reminder of something that I think you've written about and other uh, political scientists that we have moved from a world that we had in the 80s where um, people saw results and developed politics into a world where people have politics and so they develop results. And just as... Um, whether or not you perceive the economy as strong or weak in the 1990s and 2010s depended more on your partisanship than on anything that had happened to you. So it seems to have happened in the pandemic. I wouldn't have thought it was as extreme as that, but it seems as extreme as that. But there's something else that needs to be said about President Trump's approval, which is everyone's always focused on how strong his floor is. It's also worth remembering how strong his ceiling is. And the LOL, nothing matters. You can turn that job, that you can turn that around and say, you know, President Trump's been having an amazing couple of weeks with Middle Eastern diplomacy. I mean, that really positive things seem to be happening in the Middle East. Does he get any benefit? I mean, they complain, we get no benefit for it. Well, okay, well, when you get no real poll harm from mangling the worst pandemic since 1919, you're probably not gonna get a lot of upside from an Israel-UAE peace agreement. Um, so I think that the story of the Trump presidency is he, no matter what he does, he almost never falls below 40%. And also, no matter what he does, he can never climb much above 44, 45%. Um, and it's worth remembering that Donald Trump has been the most unpopular first-term president in the history of modern opinion polling. There has not been a day when he was above 50% in any poll except Rasmussen, and, which is to say, not in any poll. Um, and 
Uh, and even, on, even when we were having in 27 and 2018, some of the strongest economic numbers we'd seen since the late 1990s, he still was stuck, stuck in the 45s. And Americans have taken the measure of him. And what we are arguing about is not, can Trump break through in some way, but will the increasing defects of the American electoral system be engineered again? So this massively unpopular, a president less popular than uh, Mitt Romney in 2012, than John Kerry in 2004, way less popular than Al Gore. Um, president ba barely more popular than Michael Dukakis. Uh, can he somehow find a way to engineer a Michael Dukakis score into a second term of the presidency? I think, I mean, that's a, a lesson that comes out of your book, a way to think about the election that I think is important, not about President Trump somehow, uh, you know, proving all the pollsters wrong and, you know, surging ahead at the end, but all the dysfunction and brokenness that you talk about, do they ultimately allow for this narrow coalition president yeah. to win re-election? Yeah. Um, so, which brings so, me to, oh, yeah. I had a thought to that, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, uh, I mentioned my Canadian origin and I spent a lot of time in Canada. In, in the 2019 Canadian election, Justin Trudeau got fewer votes than his conservative opponent, Andrew Scheer, but still got reelected to the prime ministership. And that seemed to people in Canada, to precisely nobody, did that seem any kind of big deal. It happens all the time. And the reason it's not a big deal is because it's a predictable possibility in any parliamentary system. But most important, the prime minister, when you get reelected prime minister, you get the right to lead the government again. Um, but you, according to the rules, but you don't get the right to break the rules. You don't get to say, I have the nimbus of the people behind me. No, there's a person who the second most highly paid figure in the Canadian state is the leader of the opposition whose job is, who's paid to yell at you every day and to remind you, you are the leader of the government. You're not the leader of the country. Um, in the American system, the president claims the special authority and Donald Trump has claimed that Although he's, that as president, only because of the constitutional rules, he thereby acquires the right to smash the constitutional rules. Hmm. How do, uh, there's a bunch of questions on crystal ball predictions, um, which I won't ask you, but I'm gonna tie it into your chapter, How to Lose to Trump. We're now in September, September 14th, election's not far off. Uh, what do Democrats not have to do? Uh, in based on what you have in your book, it's a really good chapter in the coming yeah. month plus to not lose what seems to be a relatively good position. Well, um, the, the, the things I said in that chapter are, are going to seem a little less novel today than they were at the time I wrote them, which is a hazard of book writing. The world catches up yeah. to you. Um, but I, I think uh, as people discover that Joe Biden's superpower in the primaries was he, he didn't know how Twitter worked. He could never figure it out. Um, and he could never, and he actually never quite figure it, figured out the whole woke ideology. And there, I think there's a clip of him on tape talking about people who have become wake. Uh, <laughs> but, but that was kind of like, okay, you sound a little clueless, but that's also good because you're not getting this thing that destroyed Elizabeth Warren. Um, that that uh, there is, um, there, it seems to me there is a, you know, the country's ready for a new age of reform, um, both political, social, and economic. But the preoccupations of um, the educated upper class, or not wealthy upper class, but the, 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 those who are upper class by education, participate, I think it just seems so incredibly alien um, and threatening. Now, I have a friend who had a very important job in the 2016 Hillary Clinton campaign, and he sat in on a number of focus groups. And what he discovered about, you know, white women in the Middle West, the people they were obsessed with, and they discovered that focus group after focus group talked about the dangers of political correctness. Now, and he was sort of startled. He didn't think, why? And, and what it became clear was that these women worried that their husbands were going to make a joke that was wrong by some standard of etiquette that the family never understood and that was constantly changing. And the husband would be fired and the family would be reduced to penury. And they, when they saw that there was this, this code of etiquette that was written by their social, the socially dominant people in society that was just existed to trip them up. And, um, and I, I think Democrats need to take that very, very seriously. And um, the, that you see this tension in the, in the George Floyd protests that um, you know, when people assemble peacefully and, and uh, in, a, in an orderly way um, and, and state, the claim for equal rights. Americans respond to that with um, enormous sympathy. Um, but 
And when they obey even unfair orders from the cops about where they can stand and where they can't stand, I mean, they win. But when you have, when you have this increasing rationalization and justification of, of disorderly and outright lawless behavior, I mean, I think you can see, I think that's I, my supposition is you've seen in the past week a real softening of Biden's numbers among Latinos and especially Latinos in Florida. And I think the, the, the president's message of disorder, I think it is penetrating with a group of people who care a lot about order. And you talk, well, soon we're going to wrap up, but we have a little more time. You, you do have in the book some potential reforms uh, and you deal with issues that come up all the time. What do you think about filibuster reform? Um, I think there are liberals who believe that if, if there isn't a filibuster, then what will happen when the Republicans gain power and then they will be messed up? And I think the filibuster is the question of, raises this question. Should the current majority of the country be allowed to govern sometimes at the risk of being out of power sometimes, or should it be allowed to govern never at the expense of the other guys having less power? And it just seems to me you, you, you would want to have power sometimes. Um, and so long as the filibuster is there, um, at, and as the Senate becomes ever, ever more unrepresentative because of the concentration of power of population in the coast, the filibuster means, um, yeah, the natural majority will never govern at all. Did you always, were you always in, uh, in favor of, of this position? Or no, because, because I, I, I've been driven to it by, first, the abuse of the Republican Senate, and second, by uh, the population trends of the past 10 years, where we can really see that we are going to have, I'm now going to forget the numbers, but the, 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 you can now do a filibuster based on senators who together represent something like 15% of the population. Mm -hmm. And we're on our way to being in a situation where senators representing 11% of the population uh, can, can block a measure. Um, uh, I, I, that's not a golden, a golden bullet. And I, I, what I try through the book is to pair, I think a lot of these solutions, you need to pair things that come from the right-wing bucket with things that pair, come from the left-wing bucket. And uh, so I, one of the things I'm a big proponent of is a more restrictive approach to immigration. Um, to give people a feeling that the future of their country is being decided by Americans and not by people who just, who choose to show up, um, and and as with, uh, and on the filibuster, I think it was that you you need to have a much more serious national security. You have to try to find ways to restore the kind of consensus that we had during the Cold War among the uh, people in politics. That there there are things they don't do to each other, not because they can't, but because they feel it's wrong. If President Trump wins re-election. Um, what will unfold uh, in our democratic institutions in your mind, given all the problems that already exist? He's going to have to smash them because look, here's, here's the problem. He's, he's, he's in a world of legal trouble. And friendly courts have allowed him to push the worst of those legal troubles past voting day. He's not going to have to comply with subpoenas till after voting day. His uh, tax returns won't be in the hands of the New York state tax authorities um, with the evidence of insurance fraud and bank fraud and tax fraud that may be there. Uh, but eventually, the court said, eventually you do have to produce. And at that point, the president is going to find himself in, kinds of, in, all, kinds of, uh, in all kinds of trouble. Um, you know, that he got a $15 million payout for hurricane damage to Mar-a-Lago in 2005 that didn't happen. And a suspicious person might think, gee, this looks a lot like somebody bribed an insurance inspector uh, to collect a $15 million payday. Florida has no statute of limitations on that kind of fraud. Um, so there are going to be issue after issue like that that are going to emerge and he cannot afford, he cannot survive an independent um, system of law enforcement. He, it, either it goes or he goes. Hmm. That's a troubling way to end it, uh, but it's fitting for what you've uncovered in the book. Uh, I'm Julian Stelzer from Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. My guest was David Crum, and we're talking about his terrific new book, uh, which I'll get tongue-tied again, uh, Trump Apocalypse, um, Restoring American Democracy. It's available everywhere. Um, books are sold. I urge everyone to read it. Again, one more thoughtful piece from you on uh, the state of American politics. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Such a pleasure to be back with you at Princeton, virtually. Okay, thank you. Thanks everyone for listening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.